around the world that are tuning in to our broadcast this morning. On Tuesdays, the staff and I look at the projections of where people have logged on to watch our services, and it's everywhere from Vietnam to the United Kingdom to Texas to California to Georgia to Florida, all over the United States made possible because of COVID. How could anything good come out of COVID, amen? But God's word is being shared in a way unprecedented that we have never seen before. Two clicks of a mouse and someone can be hearing the gospel around the world. So what a privilege and a blessing that we can make the best out of an opportunity for good. But in way of prayer this morning, I want to ask you to lift up one of our saints, a special beloved saint. Of course, you all are beloved, but uh, she has a special place in many of your hearts. She teaches our, our ladies, senior ladies class. Uh, Miss Margie Prevat will be going in on the 20th of October for a knee replacement surgery, so please keep her in your prayers. I've tried to get her to quit kicking Foster, um, but I'm not sure if that has worked yet, but we do want to ask you to pray for her as she gets ready and prepared for that replacement service. Also, the reopening of our church. Many of you are experiencing some of that now as we have began to reopen. Uh, it is a three-phase process. Our next phase will begin on October 4th. We're 9.30 a.m. We will do announcements. The very thing I'm doing right now, we will begin doing again at 9.30, which is our tradition here at Eyes Memorial Baptist Church, the time of prayer for the church before we go to Sunday school. And then Sunday school will begin at 9.45 to 10.45, and then we will resume normal services, amen, on October 4th. What a wonderful day. We look forward to that. I want to remind you about an opportunity to minister uh, through our Baptist Children's Home of North Carolina. September is a special month for a special offering where we are taking up offerings for the food roundup. Again, $700,000 worth of food is donated by North Carolina Baptist churches throughout the April and October offering. Uh, because of COVID, they did not have the April food roundup. So September, we are doing that in a way of financial contributions so that we can give without having to touch a lot of things. So if you'd like to contribute to that, you can drop your offering in the black boxes on the way out of the worship center, and all of those proceeds will go directly to feeding one of the 21 different children's homes and assisted living facilities and wilderness camps here in the state of North Carolina. So thank you for your giving to that. I also want to share with you an exciting time. We are right in the season of getting ready for Sunday school. So reorganization day is what we're calling it. It will happen next Saturday at 9 a.m. to 12 noon. So if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you need assistance relocating, folks, we've had to change some of our classrooms because we have so many children. We're having to give them the bigger classroom. Isn't that a blessing? So that'll be reorganization day on the 19th. We encourage you to be here to help with that uh, as we look forward to our October coming back together. Also want to share with you that special time of the season for Operation Christmas Child. We had the privilege this week of being able to go to Charlotte and pick up 150 Operation Christmas Child boxes. Miss Ann Mills will be leading up our Operation Christmas Child efforts this year. Uh, and we have that opportunity, I believe next week, we'll get those boxes ready to start passing them out to the church. But here's the way I see it, folks. 150 boxes equal 150 children reached for Jesus. That's what we're doing. It's not so much about what's going in the box as it is the giving of the gospel that will occur through that little package. So be in prayer about that. We ask that we have almost 200 folks in our membership here at this church. There should be no problem to fill 150 boxes this year. So we want to challenge you to be praying about that, but then put your prayer into action and let's pack a box and send the gospel around the world. Also want to remind you about our Wednesday night dinners. Uh, we do ask that you RSVP. Now, if you don't RSVP, don't not come. Still come anyway. John always cooks enough food for everybody, amen? Um, as you can tell, I, I eat most of you that don't show up. I eat your servings too, right? So we want to encourage you, and please RSVP. That'll give us a good head count so we can be good stewards uh, of the food resources that we have. Also want to share with you, our church conference is September 27th. Join us at 6 p.m. We will gather together, and at that conference is where we will approve the church budget. We will talk about the manning of, of all the servants' roles and leadership in our church for the upcoming year to include teachers, volunteers, ushers, deacons, all those good things. That will take place September 27th at 6 p.m. here directly followed by an ice cream social uh, that we will do. Also want to make an announcement to our children's church as we are started back children's church last week, four years old to eight years old for children's church. Uh, during the service, they will, there will be a queue for your child to exit the worship center, and we'll go out that door into the fellowship hall where they will be greeted by a wonderful teacher that's going to share with them the Word of God. Lastly, I want to announce to you just a few birthdays that are going on. Miss Faye Stark, 
Where's Miss Faye? There you are. She'll have a wonderful birthday on the 15th. Natalie and Lincoln Shuff. Where'd they go? They're, okay, they're in the nursery, right? So they have a birthday on the 15th as well. Brother James Dick, he's hiding somewhere. James Dick and then Madison Milan will be having a birthday as well this week. So we want to encourage you uh, and have a happy and wonderful birthday. Now let's turn our heart to worship and praise as our worship team leads us. Everybody, if you would, stand with me as we sing and give honor to God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's worship him as we sing. Stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Sing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall live. this morning. Isaiah says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways my thoughts than your thoughts. He is God and worthy of worship this morning. The splendor of the King clothed in majesty let all 
all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning beginning and the end the Godhead three in one the Father Spirit Son the Lion and the Lamb the Lion and the Lamb how great is our God sing with me how great our God, all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise, my heart. Amen. We want to welcome you, and if you're a child in the ages of four to eight, I have to put that disclaimer on there because some of our adults try to leave the service and go to the children's church, uh, but we do want to ask you to go ahead and exit at this time with Miss Shannon and, and our children's church crew. We do have one of our deacons over there that's going to help also with the wrangling, so we want to thank you for that and the privilege of you entrusting our church staff with your children to teach them the gospel. So thank you for the opportunity to do that this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to share with you in way of message today. I want to, a concept that we, we all kind of understand, I think, and we, we realize it throughout life, but folks, every journey has a beginning. We all have a starting point and a starting place somewhere in life, and if you've got your Bible, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 16, I want to encourage you to find your place in verse 1, and we're going to examine verses 1 through 5 for today's message. But on that note of understanding that every journey has a beginning, I want to share with you an image to help illustrate that. And the image is of the Olympic gold medals, the bronze and the silver. Now, if you've ever had the privilege of watching the Olympics and, and seeing the athletes train and compete in what is known as the greatest sports competition in the world, that's why we call it the Olympics, you'll notice that the prize of that Olympic event is not just the competing, that's the work to get there, but it's the achieving the goal of all of the years of preparation. A 2008 Forbes article says this about the Olympic athletes. They say many of the athletes spend anywhere from 
four to eight years competing just to get on the Olympic team. Many of these athletes begin training at the ages of six and seven and eight years old, somewhere along that early point in their life, a flame was sparked in their heart for a particular desire, be it the bobsled, be it the gymnastic competitions, be it the track and field events, be it whatever the Olympic event may be, somewhere along the life, for the life of that person, their journey to the Olympic gold medal or the journey to the platform to receive the reward began somewhere and often at an early age. As we begin to look through this text of scripture today, we're going to see that Paul's life, Timothy's life, also had a beginning point and a journey that they began to walk along as they were being faithful to the very thing that God had called them to. In our sermon today, I want to share with you three main points that every journey has a beginning, that there is importance and foresight and preparation that has to go in being successful along that journey and that endeavor. And then thirdly, we have to stay the course to the journey's end. I'm reminded of the stories of many young athletes who were affected by the cancellation of the Olympic Games recently, who had trained for 8, 10, 12 years to make it to the Olympics, who have said, you know what, I don't have another four years to continue training. I have to move on with life. Sometimes it's difficult to stay the course on the journey. But we're going to see here what the scriptures share with us about the life of Paul and Timothy as they are on the journey that God has laid out for them to help them accomplish. And we will apply that to how does that affect our life and the journey, hopefully, that has begun in the body of Christ. So if you have your Bible, Acts chapter 16, picking up in verses 1 through 5, we have them on the screen for you as well. Or if you have a device, a tablet, or any other way, I don't mind seeing the Shekinah glory of your screen glowing on your face as you read from your device. But I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. Picking up in Acts 16, verses 1, reading through verse 5. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the church, the churches were strengthened in their faith, and they increased in numbers daily. If you would join me as we pray over this message. So Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that guides each and every believer. We pray now that it guides every word, everything shared. Father, may it touch our life in a way that prepares us for the journey that you've called us to. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we see in the beginning of this, let me give you a, a brief recap. What is going on here leading up to the beginning of chapter 16? Last Sunday, I shared with you the message on how sometimes conflict creates construction that is productive for the gospel. Paul was having a dispute with Barnabas over whether or not taking this man called John or also called Mark with them back on the second missionary journey that it's known as here beginning in chapter 16 where Paul would go back and he wanted to visit all the churches, all of the Greek speaking, the Greek influence, the Greek people churches that he and Barnabas had planted on their first missionary journey. And there was a dispute that arose against them. And Barnabas and Paul ends up splitting company. And instead of taking Mark with them and Barnabas together, Paul grabs a man by the name of Silvanus, that's his Greek name, or Silas. And they begin to embark upon this. And as Paul and Silas leave to go to Derby and to Lystra, that brings us to this point of the second missionary journey where Paul encounters this young man by the name of Timothy. Paul came to Derby and to Lystra and a disciple was there. Now let me stop for a minute and share with you this aspect that every journey has a beginning. I'm reminded how often when people come into a church or they enter into a religious conversation about Jesus for the first time, they didn't have a starting point or a frame of reference for what's taking place. Everything seems to be new and concepts are different and challenging. What people don't often see when they work, walk into a church is our beginning, do they? They don't see where we came from and where God started to remold our life into his image as we transitioned into what Timothy is called here as he becomes a disciple of Jesus Christ. I find it interesting that Paul had a beginning as well. Paul's beginning, we can read about in Acts chapter 9 on the Damascus Road. 
this Saul of Tarsus who was persecuting the church with such great fervor that he went to the synagogues and he asked the leaders there to give him letters of authority so that on behalf of the Jewish synagogue he could go to Damascus and continue to imprison the Christians, the people of the way, and drag them off, imprison them. You remember it was this young Saul of Tarsus that was at the feet of the stoning of Stephen, the very first Christian martyr that we see in the book of Acts that gave his life in defense of the gospel. It's the same Saul of Tarsus that was there. I would argue Paul had a radical beginning. But if you remember your life and my life, and we remember where we were in our discipleship when we first came to Christ, I would argue, folks, we all had a radical beginning in Jesus. A radical beginning, if you think about it. How did it begin? Now, with Saul of Tarsus on the road, he was crippled to his knees and blinded with a light. And he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And immediately Saul of Tarsus recognizes the voice. Who are you, Lord? He says back to Jesus. Yeah, don't worry. I'm going to show you how much you must suffer for my name's sake. And Saul of Tarsus would be led for, to Damascus where he would stay for three days, blinded, couldn't see, until a servant of God, Ananias, would go to Saul of Tarsus in a vision that he received. And God commanded Ananias, go and find him. You'll find him along Straight Street. Go and find this man and tell him what I'm going to do with him. And Ananias goes and he's faithful in the scales. The scriptures tell us something like scales fall from Paul's eyes. And after he had eaten and he drank, he immediately began to proclaim the gospel. The Bible tells us the very first place Saul of Tarsus went at the beginning of his journey with Jesus, he went right to the synagogue where his Jewish brothers would be to proclaim the Messiah that he was previously persecuting. Folks, I'd argue when people come into the church, they don't see our beginning. They don't see where our journey started often. But I can assure you, if you are a disciple of Jesus, that journey began at the cross and at the feet of Jesus. Every journey for Jesus begins at the cross, and every journey will end at the feet of Jesus one day when we were in his presence. So the Apostle Paul had a radical beginning, but so did this young man by the name of Timothy. I want to turn our attention to Timothy and what's going on here. Notice the scriptures in verse 16, right at the beginning, describe Timothy. A disciple was there. Now, we've got to stop for a moment. We, we bypass rudimentary truths often, and we don't understand the gravity of what is being communicated here. Notice Timothy wasn't a church member. That's not how he was described in the text. He didn't hold membership at the church in Antioch or the church in Derby or the church in Lystra. His name wasn't on the rolls at the annual conference that they would call to make sure everybody was still attending. Notice Timothy is called a disciple of Jesus. Now, in order to be a disciple, we have to commit ourselves to the teaching of that person or sect that we're committed to. The Jews would commit themselves and they would choose a rabbi to study under, much like Paul did with Gamaliel, the greatest rabbi known. Many will still attribute him as the greatest rabbi and teacher to have ever lived. But we know that's not a completely true statement because Jesus was the greatest rabbi and the greatest teacher to ever live. And it was this Jesus now that not only did Paul's journey begin, but also we see here that Timothy is a disciple of this same Jesus. Notice the second sentence. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. You see, Timothy, a disciple, had a beginning as well. Timothy is mentioned in six of the opening epistles of the Pauline epistles. He's mentioned six times in the very beginning. Some would argue co-authorship with Saul of Tarsus or Paul, the apostle. But he's mentioned at least in six of the Pauline epistles in the very opening statements. He would be considered the son of the faith of the Apostle Paul. And Paul would take a special liking to Timothy, much like he did his own son. He considered Timothy to be one of his sons in the faith. Timothy would be in prison for the gospel. Timothy would be responsible for establishing the leadership of the church. Now, I would argue that Timothy's journey in Jesus didn't begin understanding where it would end up. Many like you and I today... In my wildest dreams, I never thought I'd be standing in a pulpit proclaiming the gospel as a pastor. Uh, if you put me on my top ten things I want to do with my life list, being a pastor was none of them. 
Being a preacher was none of them. Being a Sunday school teacher wasn't on there. Being a deacon wasn't on there. Being a Christian wasn't on there. Until the age of 26, my journey begins, where Jesus radically transformed me at the foot of the cross, like he did for many of you. And here we are on the journey of life as Jesus is continuing to guide us. Now, this issue of Timothy and this issue of Paul, now I would argue, much like our Olympic athletes, much like Saul of Tarsus and much like Timothy, they didn't get there by themselves. There was some supporting effort that went along the way. Every journey has supporters along the way of life. Now, it's interesting here that Timothy's mother is mentioned in the gospel. The son of a Jewish, excuse me, in this, in this Acts, the historical account of the, of the faith. Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. Now, when we say she was a believer, it's specifically referring to the gospel. It's specifically referring to a pisto, uh, uh, putting her faith in Jesus Christ. That is what's referenced here. So the mother was a believer. How many of you are sitting here today because grandma or mom shared the gospel with you? Shared the truth of the gospel story? Helped you along the way when you were young, perhaps an early child, much like Timothy was, when he began to hear about the gospel. He began to hear about Jesus. He began to see his mother's actions. And his grandmother, we'll see in a moment, that Miss Lewis, they, they were living out their faith. And Timothy, as a young boy, saw that. And it made such an impact in him that he also believed upon Jesus Christ and became a disciple of following the way. 2 Timothy 1.5 tells us the following. I'm reminded, and Paul is writing to Timothy, again, his son in the faith. 2 Timothy would be Paul's last will and testament, if you will. Paul knew he was in prison, fixing to die. He was writing to Timothy his last letter that he would write to anybody. Many believe that 2 Timothy was the last letter penned by the Apostle Paul. And here's what he writes about Timothy. He says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. You see, Timothy had help getting started. Timothy had supporters along the way. Timothy had someone there to help explain the gospel to him to get him started on his journey on the right track. He had his mother and his grandmother. They lived out their faith modeling it. But also I want to share with you that every journey faces difficulty. Every journey faces difficulty. What's difficult to see in our English translation here is in the Greek text it makes it clear through the way the Greek is formed that Timothy's father was dead, was a Greek. When we understand that text, we see that the grandmother and the mother is raising Timothy alone. One of the saddest things in America right now, and I'm not going to bore you with statistics is the amount of children being raised in single-family homes where there is only a mother present and the father is absent. And the African community, African-American community, some statistics point to 67% of African-American households are without a father in the home. 33% for Anglo-white Americans. And you can go on and on looking at statistics, but how sad it is and how much fatherless homes are on the increase in today's culture and society. At a rate that we have never seen before, more and more homes are single parent, single mother, raising a son and daughter by themselves without a husband, without a father present. You think that provides difficulty? You better believe it. Here, Timothy starting his journey as a disciple, being mentored by his grandma and his mother, and then all of a sudden, God paves the way and sends the Apostle Paul to begin to give him that leadership and that growing and that nurturing needed by something that often, quite frankly, only a boy can get from a man. Amen. And here Timothy is getting grown. Timothy's father is presumed dead. Mom and grandma. Notice the scripture in 2 Timothy 3.15. Tell us exactly how Lewis and Eunice developed Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.15. And how from your childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You see, his mother and his grandmother didn't bring him salvation. His mother and his grandmother were faithful in teaching him the Scriptures. And we know that when we study the Scriptures, Scripture leads us to salvation. 
Scripture points the way to Jesus. Scripture convicts the soul and the heart of our need for redemption and our need to return or repent of our sins and to accept Christ and what he's done for us. You see, the scriptures are what's being taught. I'd argue for our parents today, the scriptures are what your young children are being taught in our fellowship hall. It's the scriptures that impact the life of each and every one of us who are disciples and those who are still listening to learn to understand who this Jesus is. It's the scriptures that impacted Timothy, and I would argue it is the scriptures that remain the core of what impact you and I today. That's why we teach and preach through the scriptures. Every journey faces difficulty. Every journey has supporters along the way. But friend, every journey has to have a beginning. Otherwise, it's not a journey. We call it a floundering, call it a flapping, call it a wandering, call it a wondering. But folks, when we grab a hold of Jesus and he commences our journey to begin, we're on one heck of a ride together. Amen. Because he'll take you places you never thought you would be. I'd argue he's taking me places that if he told me up front I'd be going, I'd be a little afraid to go. My question to you is, do you have a beginning? Do you know that you know without a shadow of a doubt your journey with Jesus has begun? Are you a disciple of Jesus? I don't care about your church membership. That won't save you. It should. should mean something. But we've learned that it doesn't. But are you a disciple of Jesus? Has your journey begun? I hope it has begun for you. And if you need help, we're here through the scriptures to encourage you, much like Paul did with Timothy, much like his grandmother and mother did for him, to lead you in that direction. But I want you to turn your attention to verse 3 for a moment. I want to share with you the importance of foresight and preparation for the journey. Now, I want you to hold on to your hats for a minute. This is going to be an area of Scripture that often people are challenged by what they presume to be a contradiction in the teaching of the Apostle Paul when we look at this issue of circumcision. And why would he have Timothy do this when clearly the Galatian letter that he wrote says we're no longer under the law, we're under grace. Why would he circumcise this young man when we no longer have to do that? So let's dig into this for a moment, and I hope to provide some clarity for you on how do we apply this to understand the importance of foresight and preparation on our journey with Jesus. Picking up in verse 3, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, number one, we've got to see that Paul was a strategic thinker. He was not like many of us who don't think strategically. Every move that he is being led to by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit enabled Paul to be a strategic thinker, and he's having to think about what is going to go on in the future in the ministry that now Timothy is going to be a part of that would help prepare the ministry for successful encounters with others. You see, Paul understood that Timothy, being a Greek male father, but also belonging to a Jewish woman, he was also Jewish. He was also a Jew. The old adage, no sense in throwing the baby out with the bathwater, that doesn't mean that you can't be a good Jew and still be a good Christian. And Paul understood what was going on and the controversy that would, that would ensue in the following books, verses in Acts. When we look at Acts 21 and Acts 17, we will see that there are some benefits of Timothy. I want to share with you one theologian by the name of David Peterson. He summarizes the challenges here about this strategic thinking this way. He says, from a narrative perspective, the story has three functions. First, it clarifies what was decided at the Jerusalem Council. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 15, you will see there this letter that was given to the Apostle Paul to go and take back to the churches to let them know that they didn't have to keep the letter of the law of the Jewish synagogue, but rather to remain unstained, undefiled, out of sexual immorality, not taking food offered to idols, and if they do that, they do well. That was what came out of the Jerusalem council. Now here we see that Paul is writing this issue of Timothy to be circumcised. One would scratch his head and see why the need for this. Peterson goes on to say the following, by opening the door of freedom to Gentile Christians, the church did not close the door to Jewish Christians. That's good, ain't it? You ever thought about that perspective? He left the door open. Everything appropriate to that tradition could still be practiced, so long as it was understood not to have to have cultural rather than soteriological significance, meaning salvation. Those acts don't save me. They can have cultural significance, but they don't save me themselves. Now, folks, I was 
I don't say this publicly too often. I don't know if I've ever said this publicly. I was born in Maine, y'all, right? I'm in the South, by the way, by the grace of God, right? Now, when I was growing up, my, my, my parents gave me this thing called cream of wheat. Now, in the South, y'all already know where I'm going with it, right? You're already scratching your head. In the South, we don't have cream of wheat in the South, right? That's the first indicator. You ain't from around here, are you, right? Now, the second indicator was this. When I met my wife, Shannon, at the wonderful age of 15, she weren't my wife then, but we started dating, and, and in the South, they brought me a bowl of grits, right? Got some grits instead of cream of wheat. I'm good with grits. I've been raised in the South. I'm true Southern. If you took my blood, you'd see. I'd have mosquitoes in there and everything else, but grits. Now, she's sitting across the table. We're still dating. Now, this is how gracious she is. She still married me after this. I reach for the sugar to put sugar on my grits, right? Now, y'all, I promise I'm converted at this point. I'm true Southerner at this point. But she knew right away, culturally, there was just something wrong about you putting sugar on your grits. You know, they get salt and pepper and butter. They don't get anything else. Now, that's the way I eat them now. She converted me. But isn't it interesting how cultural things have an impact on how we perceive other people? Right now, today, as a grown man in the South, when I go down to the diner and I have my grits, if someone sees me pouring sugar on it, I have lost my witness, right? It's gone. We know that. The same thing would have been true here for Timothy trying to go into a Jewish synagogue to the inner temple, the place where they would be teaching, the inner, the inner areas where the, the scriptures would be taught. And now Saul of Tarsus, Paul the apostle, is now bringing this apostate, half-Jew, in their presence. See, Paul understood the cultural challenges that would be placed upon that. And he had Timothy circumcised. That way he wouldn't lose his witness as he was going around in those areas. Everything is appropriate to that tradition and they could still practice it. But it didn't bring salvation. Thirdly, Luke prepares for 2121, making it clear in advance that there was no basis for the complaint that Paul was insisting the Jews forsook Moses in particular, that they would not circumcise their children. Now, we're not there yet, but when we get to Acts chapter 21, you'll see that one of the issues and the riots that ensue is the crowd was accusing Paul of teaching they no longer have to keep the law of the Jews. Well, here we are in chapter 16, and he had the foresight to prepare for that journey he'd be taking, and having Timothy circumcised would pretty much say your argument is baseless because I have said keeping the traditions are okay. You can do that and still be who you are. Whether your traditions don't save you, only Jesus saves you. He made that clear and it was understood. In 1 Corinthians, however, we see a letter that's given to the Corinthian church. And I'll just read quickly for you, verse seven, seven, chapter 7, verses 18 through 20. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. See, Paul's not contradicting himself here, but we've got to understand the journey that Jesus has us on, folks, often is going to require decisions that are preparing us for three years from now that we don't even see on the horizon. What God is doing in your life and in my life today in preparation for what he holds in store for your life in five years, we have the privilege of looking back and saying, man, I didn't even see God doing that. But now I can see it 10 years ago, 20 years ago, what he was doing in my life. I didn't see it at the time, but now I can. Man, I wonder how many things God is doing to prepare you for the journey that he has. How much foresight and preparation is he doing in your life today? to get you where he wants you to be in three, four, five, ten years from now. Often we don't recognize it. But man, wouldn't it be wonderful if we would be led by the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, I'll go wherever you lead, I'll go. Wherever you lead, I'll go. What a beautiful hymn that is. Wherever you lead, I'll go. I'd argue with you, what decisions today do you need to make in your life to help you be more prepared for the journey that Jesus is taking you on. You see, there are some decisions that we make that are absolutely critical and strategic in our daily life. The decisions to open our day with Scripture. The decisions to spend time with God in prayer. The decisions to unite with a church that faithfully teaches the Scriptures. The decisions to be part of a small group, a community of disciples that is doing life together. 
Folks, all those things stack up to be strategic decisions to help prepare us for the journey that Jesus is taking us on. They're not just church things we do. That's the strategy that God has given us for his church to be his people, to go on his journey of life. What a wonderful thing when we make the right decisions to be successful along our journey. Imagine if Paul hadn't circumcised Timothy, the challenges that would have brought. Imagine if Timothy's mother and grandmother hadn't began teaching him the scriptures as a young boy. Who would Paul have taken along and written the wonderful pastoral epistles to? Some other guy. But God planned on it being Timothy. Folks, God plans on you being part of his story along life's journey. How are you preparing for that? We all have to prepare. But thirdly, let me share with you, how do we stay on the course? How do we stay on the course of this journey? Because, folks, if the Lord tarries, some of us have a lot more years ahead of us. Some have more behind us than we have in front of us. Some, this may be our last week on the earth. We don't know. I did a funeral this week for a, a, a member of our church. We didn't know when that day would come, but this I do know. That day comes for every single one of us. So how do we stay on the journey that Jesus has us on? Or how do we start the journey that Jesus wants us to be on? Let's look at verse 4 and 5 together. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for the observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. Now, the last time I saw this was in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, where they continued to grow and they increased those being saved daily. People were coming to Christ. Now we see it transitioned to the church is being strengthened in the faith and the church is increasing in numbers daily. Now, folks, don't put your stock in numbers, noses, and nickels. Right? But what they are for you and I is an indicator of the healthiness of what's going on in God's economy. God brings and draws all men to himself. When we are faithful in doing some things that I'm going to share with you in a moment, we can't help but not grow because that's God's plan for his church. Amen? It was not a plan for us four no more. It was a plan for us to reach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So let me give you some affirmations quickly. Three affirmations for the church. Now I'm going to give this to you in good Baptist fashion, right? About 12 different parts. Three affirmations for the church. Three things we can do to help prepare us and to see God's work along our journey of life. Number one, the church was strengthened in their faith. Notice that's what the scripture tells us in verse 5. The church was strengthened in their faith. Now, how do we recognize a faithful church? What strengthens us? What is the, 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 the rock, the, the rebar, the concrete, the, the wiring, the foundation that holds us together to make us strong? Let me give you four areas. Number one, there was a commitment to Christ. A commitment to Christ. What we see here in verse 4, they, they delivered to the churches were the observance and the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. What were they? They weren't a list of legalistic rules you've got to keep in order to be right with Jesus. They were, hey, here's the reality. If you're a believer, you come to Christ by faith and faith alone. It's a gift of God, not by works, lest no man shall boast. They understood that at the Jerusalem Council. So they gave some instruction to help keep the church strong by avoiding things that would tarnish the witness, avoiding sexual immorality, drunkenness, all of those things that are in the Jerusalem letter. And that's what Paul and Silas and Timothy went about on their second missionary journey from church to church, teaching them the scriptures, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that by faith and faith alone, that it was a gift of God, not by works, lest no man shall boast, right? That salvation comes not in our outward actions, but on an internal issue that the Holy Spirit draws us unto a relationship with Christ. When we recognize that we are a sinner in need of salvation, when we recognize that there are none good, no, not one, the psalmist would write. Paul would write about it in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. He would go on and say, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. What a beautiful understanding. So what were they committed to? Number one, they were committed to Jesus, not the church, not their constitution and bylaws, not the Southern Baptist Convention, not the North Carolina Baptist Convention, not their pastor. They were committed to Christ. Jesus, first and foremost. 
Folks, if we had a little more Jesus commitment amongst the church and broad, we would change the world. Don't commit yourself to me. I will fail you, I promise. Just give me enough time. I've already failed some of you, and you're still here. God bless you, right? It's a journey. Sometimes God has to correct our course, get us back on the track. But our commitment to Christ is first and foremost. We see that in the church. Number two, there was a commitment to discipleship. You can't be a casual Christian. You show up at 11 o'clock, there's no other discipleship in your life, and you wonder, imagine now, imagine this for a minute, if you were an Olympic athlete and you only trained once a, day, one, once a week for the Olympics. Four times a month you trained. How, how well you think you'd compete in the Olympic race? You wouldn't make the team. Well, thankfully, we're not competing in the Olympics, right? But the point is, we can't expect to be a disciple of Jesus and we get about 30 minutes of him a, a week and think that's all we need. We need to be a disciple of Jesus, like Timothy, a disciple in Lystra, in Derby. Number three, a commitment to holiness. Now, when we're committed to Christ, when we're committed to discipleship, there begins to have a desired effect in our life that we commit ourselves to living holy, where we resist those things that tempt us to walk away from Jesus. Now, folks, those happen to every single believer. Don't you think for a minute that you come to Christ and your life's going to be hunky-dory. No, your next life's going to be hunky-dory. But this life, you're going to have challenges. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be challenged. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be pulled away. Satan will wage all-out warfare against you if you are living a life committed to Christ as a disciple of Jesus, seeking holiness. You better believe it. He will jump on your back like you've never seen before. What good does he have? I once heard Adrian Rogers say, if you've never met the devil, it's because you two are going in the same direction. But when we turn, meant to know you, and we repent of our sin, and we follow Jesus, now we're on a head-on collision. Because he's going to show up, and he's going to do it in a way that's going to test our holiness, often with the very things that are your passions in life he will tempt you with. May Jesus be our passion, amen? Fourthly, though, there's a commitment to one another. Isn't it beautiful that Jesus gave us each other to help us remain strong? A relationship is what we have through Jesus Christ, not religion. But our relationship extends beyond our horizontal alignment with our vertical alignment. Right? We have a relationship with Christ which helps me have a relationship with one another. The body of Christ is meant to strengthen each other our life groups, our small groups, our Sunday school classes, all the things we do corporately here at Eyes Memorial Baptist Church is to strengthen our relationships with one another. So when your foundation gets a little crack in it, you got someone there linking arms with you, saying, I love you. I'm here with you. You can depend on me to help you get through that difficult time of your life, this season of temptation that may be growing. So the church was strengthened in their faith. They did it these four ways. And I think that is a timeless principle that the scriptures teach us still apply for you and I. But secondly, the church grew because of faith. Not only were they a faithful, they grew because of faith. I would argue three reasons that a healthy church grows. Let me give them to you. Number one, a healthy church grows because found people find people. Let that sink in for a minute. Now, I've been a part of evangelism outreach events. I've trained evangelism teams. I've, I've led it for our church for different seasons of times in different places and different ministries. But here's the truth that I know that's sustainable. Those, those evangelism teams and those outreach events, they always fizzle out. Every single one I've been a part of. I start with 25 people, and three months into it, I'm down to four. Three months into it, I'm down to one, and even I want to quit, Right? what happens to them but here's the truth of what i know about the scriptures found people find people when you've got a message so good to be true you can't help but not share it with someone else when you go to a restaurant that just opened and man they got some good thai food right you post it on facebook don't you Woo, just just had my socks knocked off at this place the curry's smoking we post it because it's so good we, we want our friends to know about it Man, imagine if we took the same concept with the gospel of Jesus. That our discipleship group has got so much life in it, and when they're so supportive of one another, that they're doing life together, that I can't help but invite someone else to be a part of it. That the preacher is so crazy, you got to come check this out, right? We want to invite somebody, you know, you ain't seen nothing like, come check this out, right? 
We want to share what's going on because found people find people. That's the church that we're called to be. This church here grew because they were finding people. Why? Because they had an excitement burning in them that didn't get drowned out by the things of their world. I thought about it this week, how much stuff is going on in my daily life, weekly life, all the things that we deal with now that that the first century church didn't have to deal with. They had their own challenges. We got our own. But man, think about all the things that jockey for our attention weekly. All the priorities we have. The tyranny of the urgent overriding the most important weekly in our life. I found one of the bad habits as I studied business. One of the bad habits I had gotten into is as soon as I get into the office, I immediately check my email. Then I had a scholar once tell me, he says, son, you're, you're doing it all wrong. He says, you're letting your computer dictate your priorities. He said, you do what you know you need to do and set a time to check those emails and respond. You'll be a whole lot more effective at what you do in life. Now imagine if we applied that to our church life. We didn't let Wednesday night stop us from gathering when we can. Now I got it. There's exceptions and reasons why we make the decisions we can and why we do. But imagine when priority becomes such a, a priority of prayer becomes such a priority in your life that you put it on your work schedule. 6.30, corporate prayer at Eisman World Baptist Church. 7.30, corporate Bible study at Eisman World Baptist Church. 9.30, assembly. Eyes Memorial Baptist Church to hear what the work the kingdom is doing. 1045, 945, Sunday school, life group, fellowship, to learn to grow. Folks, here's what I've what I know. What we prioritize in our life is what gets done. Period. You want to go bass fishing, you go bass fishing. You want to go deer hunting, you go deer hunting. You want to work in the shop, you work in the shop. The things we want to do are the things we do. Because if I want a day off, I ask my boss, hey, I need a day off. I need to go fishing. I need to go to a birthday. I need to go out of town. We submit a form. The Muslim has no problem asking for Friday off to go to mosque so he can pray. How about us? What are we willing to do? What is our priority? Found people, find people. Number two, sharing the gospel was central to their life. It wasn't a program. It was central to who they were. So they could see their friends, their relatives, their loved ones, their neighbors, their co-workers come to Christ. Thirdly, sharing the gospel was natural. It wasn't forced. They had a story. They knew where their journey began, and they wanted to see other people join along with them on the journey with Jesus. See, it's natural when we do those things. The church grew because of faith. Thirdly, the church increased in impact by faith. The church increased in impact by faith. Here's three things that a healthy church does well. Number one, a healthy church sows. A healthy church sows. It's not about us. A healthy church has an outward focus that it's about doing for our community, for our families, for our loved ones. A healthy church is not stingy holding on to things, but rather open-handed to let it go because we know it's God who gives the increase. And when we need more, God will provide it if we're faithful with the little that we have. Healthy churches sow, but healthy churches not only sow, but healthy churches grow. We see throughout the New Testament in the beginning of the book of Acts, which is our historical bridge, we have the four gospels beforehand, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Then we have the Acts of the Apostles, probably better term, some of the Acts of the Apostles, as a historical telling of what was going on in the life of the first century church. Then we get into the Pauline epistles and the general letters and the book of Revelation. But right here we find our place in the book of Acts where we see that healthy churches are growing numerous times and God added to the church daily. The multitudes came to Christ. 3,000 were added at Pentecost. The number would increase later on. Those served as an indicator of the healthiness of what was going on in the gospel. And I would argue today for churches that are growing if we are healthy in our growth, not a revolving door of people coming and going, but we are healthy in making disciples, God says we are a healthy church. And thirdly and lastly, healthy churches go. Healthy churches sow, healthy churches grow, and healthy churches go. We have a heart for taking the gospel. Now, I'm not talking about Vietnam or Alaska or Honduras. When's the last time you've gone next door? It's the last time you've gone in your neighbor's backyard. It's the last time you've gone 
to your lunchroom and had a conversation of the gospel with a coworker. Folks, that's where we need to start going. If we don't have a heart to share the gospel at home, there's no need to go anywhere to share the gospel. It's got to burn bright right here before it radiates to the rest of the world. So let me close by asking you this question. Are you on course? Are you on course for the journey that Jesus has set you on when he found you where you were and changed you and made you something you could never become on your own? Where are you on your journey? Maybe you need to begin that journey. That decision can be made today. The Bible tells us clearly how do we start that. He says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that he was raised from the dead, then you will be saved. For one confesses with the mouth and the righteousness and one believes in the heart and the salvation. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the way Jesus is saying, I'm ready for you to start your journey. Are you? Are you ready to give your life to Christ? Maybe you have, and that's wonderful. But if you haven't, right where you are, you can pray. Lord, forgive me of my sin. I accept you as my Savior. Come into my heart. Live in me. Give me that Holy Spirit that the preacher's talking about. Help me to live for you, to be a disciple all the days of my life. And here's what I know about God's Word. He is faithful. He is true. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How are you on your course, church member? Are you a disciple? Are you following Christ in a way that makes an impact to others? That others, when they look at your life, they know you're on a journey. You're going somewhere for Jesus. You've got a plan to be used right where you are in life for the kingdom's glory, for his good. If you're a disciple, folks, that's the only option we have as a disciple. So let me share with you those three images Hard work and effort is what it takes to earn a gold medal in the Olympics. Now, folks, we can't work our way to salvation, but we can be faithful once we understand the journey that God has us on. And we know that our journey, unlike these Olympic athletes that began at the age of six, seven, on some gymnastic floor mat somewhere around the world, our journey begins at the foot of the cross. And when we see Jesus and we see that cross, we understand that's the starting point for every single believer in our journey for Jesus. Everyone is equal at the foot of the cross. There are none too far gone that Jesus can't save you. If he could save me, and if he could save some of y'all, he could save anybody. Amen? (laughs) Amen. We all start our journey at the foot of the cross. None are too far gone, even you at home. If you need Jesus, he's ready and willing. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me land the plane here real quick. Do you know that your journey has started with Jesus? Do you know that you know for a fact? Well, preacher, how can I? Scripture is clear that you can have the assurance of eternal life through Jesus Christ. You can have it if you started your journey with Jesus. In church, I'd ask you, Where are you along the life's journey? Maybe you're off course a little bit. Maybe you need a slight course correction. I'd argue Jesus is willing and waiting. He's never left the road. He's still there pulling you back onto the right course that you can achieve the journey of a lifetime. So, Father, we thank you for your message. We thank you for your word. We pray now that the Holy Spirit would convict us where we need the challenge, comfort us where we need the comfort. And Father, I pray that the message will stir any soul that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that has not begun that journey, to begin it today by praying those wonderful words. Father, I thank you now for the service. Have your way in all that is said and done. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're at home today and you've made that decision, please let us know. Send us a little message on Facebook or you can call us. And If you're here today during our, our song that we're about to sing, we have a time of invitation. If you've made a decision to follow Christ, then you can let us know that by walking forward or seeing me directly after the service so we can pray with you. But with that said, let's stand and sing as our worship team leads us in our final song as we leave this place.
thunder on Calvary's mount outpoured. There where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon. the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Wider than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, fellowship. Let's pray together as we ask God's blessing upon us as we leave this place. So Father, we thank you for the encouragement, Lord. We thank you for the equipping you've given us through your word and through the fellowship of one another, the strength that we have to, to continue on this journey that you've set for us, knowing that we can rely upon you for you are faithful. Lord, I pray that you be watch over every family and every person present, every child, every person that is serving the body of Christ here. Father, keep them safe from this COVID issue. Keep them safe as they travel Lord, bring us back together to praise you and to worship your name, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.
thanks for being so flexible. You just come in and pick up, you, you know, you pick up my ideas so quick.